Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is The Love and Use of Mediumship and is part of the Spirit Relationship Series. It was presented in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia on the 7th of April 2012. This is Session 1, Part 2. So all through that time, Timothy was still on Earth and uh, he finished up because of his uh, feelings of loss of his soulmate, he had a lot of grief in himself to feel. And uh, he f finished up spending most of his time talking about travelling uh, around Europe uh, and the Middle East, telling the truth to others and talking about the truth to others. And he, because of his connection with his soulmate, he, he of course never remarried or anything like that after that. And he died nearly 30 years after after Rachel. So that gives you a bit of background of Rachel and Timothy and there's far more background of course in amongst all of that that they could give you. They were personal acquaintances of myself and Mary, uh, very close friends and so we, uh, they can tell you many things about myself and Mary and life in the first century and the things they experienced and the things that we actually did say that are not recorded in the Bible and so forth but we'll have to leave all of those things for another day. Um, now, there are the spirits who we'd like to uh, encourage to talk about this subject with you of the loving use of mediumship. And we would like to cover five particular, four or five particular things with you with regard to the loving use of mediumship. The, f the first thing we'd like to talk about with you with regard to the loving use of mediumship is the underlying reason why God opened communication between spirits and mortals. The primary reason why God opened communication between people in the spirit world and people on earth is so that the people who are of development in the spirit world could pass new truths to people on earth. So this had been opened many, many years ago. When I say many years ago, Almost 120,000 years ago, this ability to communicate began between spirits and people on earth. And as a result of the ability to communicate, the earth went through many changes. Some of them were quite good changes and others were quite difficult changes. Every time spirits in the spirit world got into a space of hearing new truth, they usually tried to find a person on earth that they could transmit this truth to. And once they found a person on earth that they could transmit the truth to, they then spent some time with the person, developing the person emotionally so that they could receive those truths that the persons in the spirit world had discovered. Once they did that, the person on earth began what you would now call a religious movement. Does that make sense? So every single religious movement, and in fact every single religious thought that ever began on earth, began from somebody in the spirit world communicating it to a person on earth. And unfortunately, uh, of course, many times the communication was inaccurate. And so sometimes accurate things were tra transmitted and other times inaccuracies were transmitted. Of course, all of these spirits were on the, in, the, in a natural love condition of varying types. So, 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 for example, when a spirit raised into the second sphere condition and discovered a whole new set of truths that nobody had ever discovered up until that point, then what would happen is that spirit generally had a strong desire to communicate those truths to others, others in the spirit world and others on earth. And usually what they tried to do is develop a person on earth who could receive that communication. Now, the reason why Michael, what you, who you call Michael the Archangel is a very common person in terms of knowledge in New Age circles, but also in the Bible, is because Michael was often one of the first persons who reached that new condition from the second dimension to the sixth dimension. For that reason, and Michael's always had a very, very strong desire to share his knowledge that he discovered with other people. And so he would often try to find a person on earth and mentor that person on earth into a condition to where that person could transmit some of these truths to earth. Does that make sense? Once the person got into a certain kind of condition where Michael could transmit some of those truths, then Michael would 
encourage the person to spend time uh, ch channeling information, if you, which we would call it now. Back in his day, many times it was called prophecy or doing things prophetically. But he would, he would transmit this information to people on earth. And often he would select a person specifically for that particular task, a person who was a bit more open than the rest of society and also a person generally who had a bit more courage than the rest of society because it would generally need courage to transmit new truths to a society that uh, was resistive to those truths. Does that make sense? So one of the primary purposes of mediumship at this point in human history was the sharing of information between a person in the spirit, from a person in the spirit world who had learned or gathered that information to a person on earth. Now, of course, the person on earth had to be of a specific development to receive that information. So that, that was the underlying limitation with regard to the transmission of the truth. So that's purpose number one. The second, a secondary purpose, due to the opening now of rapport that could occur, unfortunately with all opening of any ability, so as you can see with on, on Earth now at the moment, we all have the ability to engage in sexual intercourse, for example. Unfortunately, with any ability that we have, uh, we also, there is also um, a degree of misuse of it on the planet. And this also applies to the gift of mediumship. So often uh, we misuse mediumship on the planet uh, for, for many different reasons. Most of them, of course, are to do with our emotional addictions. And so um, a, an unloving use of mediumship also began at the same time. And the unloving use of mediumship was spirits who are often quite earthbound communicating uh, to people on earth and instigating people on earth into acts that would d damage their moral and emotional condition. Does that make sense? And unfortunately, um, while some individuals on earth improved in their condition, because of now the openness to people on earth to communicating with spirits, um, many people on earth degraded their condition. And often the degradation of this condition would, uh, would occur over thousands of years, uh, often up to 16,000 years, um, these cycles would occur. And eventually a, an event would occur on Earth, such an Earth, uh, what, what we call an Earth change event. An event where God's love, the waves of love were increasing and the disharmony between God's waves of love and the condition of the people on Earth were quite large. And as a result of those, uh, those disharmonies, um, there would be a series of events occur on Earth uh, that would affect the Earth itself. And therefore, many people on Earth would pass into the spirit world and there would be some people left on Earth after those events, depending on their severity. And those people who were left were often people who were more open to connecting with uh, the Earth itself and, and connecting to uh, living in a more natural way. And so a cycle began again, where eventually the pe those people would would grow in their uh, connection with the planet, connection with the earth, they'd grow in their knowledge. But unfortunately, they'd grow in their knowledge and once they grew in their knowledge and their condition, they were more open to spirit influence. And when they became more open to spirit influence, sometimes that influence was quite negative because of the previous generations of spirits that have passed and that then often influenced that cycle back down again into the, into the poor condition of the hells. And the earth would then go through another period of upheaval. Does that make sense? And we have been, as Michael pointed out to you in uh, a previous channeling, we've been through, from, from the time that he has been alive, seven of those cycles um, of the improvement and degradation, improvement and degradation and so forth of what happens on the earth. Now, can you see from that that on one hand, the improvement has occurred through the opening of the ability to communicate with spirits in higher development, but the degradation occurs because God doesn't limit a particular gift to one type of individual, and as a result of that, um, many people in the spirit world and on earth have used the gift negatively and therefore caused the degradation of what happens on the planet uh, as well. And so we go through these cycles, unfortunately. Which, which don't need to occur, but they occur because of the misuse of mediumship. 
So actually, if you think about it, one of the primary reasons why we go through these negative cycles on earth is because of the misuse of mediumship. Can you see how important it is? Right? And many people on earth, and many people even right now who are involved in mediumship on earth, have no understanding that actually uh, of the responsibility that mediumship entails. Because it has the ability to either severely improve the condition of people on earth, or it has completely the opposite ability to severely affect negatively the condition of people on earth. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? So would you like to ask any questions about that so far? Yeah? If we... So is that why... Um, thank you very much, by the way, for this topic. It's like you've just read my mail and <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so is that why in the Bible they've basically discouraged that? Like with a lot of religion, Christian religion, it's uh, you're communing with the devil and, and so that was sort of just a way of, of stopping this deg degradation perhaps? Yes, unfortunately many, um, many of the so-called laws, natural laws that are now contained in the Bible and also other holy books began initially because of the concerns that some individuals, individuals who weren't affected by the negative use of mediumship at the time, uh, had with the use of mediumship. So instead of refining the heart of the individual to improve mediumship, what they decided to do is to make a series of laws which would control mediumship. Now, unfortunately, there were two motives for this. One motive was positive in the sense that the mo mo motive was that... Uh, I've just got a problem with my mic. I'll just try and move it around. Um, one of the motives was to uh, try and improve the use of mediumship, um, by, by, unfortunately, by saying, no, there's a ban on it altogether. <laughs> In other words, any person who uses mediumship is, is classified as an individual um, uh, that is under the influence of evil forces, and unfortunately, um, historically, many of them were put to death. There, was a law, there were laws initially created that caused many mediums to be put to death, which, of course, highly discouraged <laughs> mediumship. But there was another motive too, and the secondary motive was a motive of spirits in dark condition who were also trying to prevent the, the transmission of truth to the earth. And so uh, many of those spirits realise that uh, some people on earth, who we often refer to as the prophets of old, um, who were involved in mediumship, were of quite good moral development. They had quite a lot of personal integrity. They had a lot of quite personal honesty. They were of good development. They weren't sexually permissive. Um, so they had quite a lot of uh, good moral development, which enabled them to connect to spirits and connect to spirits who are of a higher condition. And unfortunately, they, cha they channeled a lot of material which was completely the opposite of, of what these darker spirits wanted to see channeled. And so it also aided the blockage to mediumship through these laws, aided the, a dar a, the darkness to prevail as well. In other words, it stopped the transmission of good information to the earth. So that was a, it's also a purpose, a, a secondary purpose to it. So unfortunately, um, the so-called priesthood then gained control of almost all religion on the planet. And when I say the priesthood, these are people who believe that they were the intermediaries between God and men and that they could determine by force, by violence, uh, what people uh, were allowed to receive or not receive. And uh, by the time that myself and Mary were born in the first century, these, this priesthood was firmly established in almost all religious movements on the planet. Uh, this, which were all, and it's always about control. It's always about the control. So unfortunately, there, were, there was an underlying positive reason initially as to why people put a ban on the mediumship altogether. Not that it, there is anything positive that ever came from it, but... Unfortunately, in this process, uh, there was also a negative uh, response, 
and that was that no truth could now be easily channeled to the planet without the person uh, having the threat of death uh, upon their head. And so many people who channeled after that became recluses. They, were, they pulled away from society and unfortunately they channeled a lot of information that was truthful but they didn't give it to society because of the fear of their own death. So that's where the courage aspect comes in that yes. you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there is a great need for courage when it comes to living in harmony with truth. And unfortunately, many people who have heard truth in the past through this mediumship connection have not had the courage to give that information to others because of the different personal threats made upon them personally that would in most instances have resulted in their own death. Mm. Mm. Uh, I think I've heard you say that the general or collective soul condition of humanity um, is actually better now than certain times in the past. Um, no, I haven't necessarily said that. Okay. I've said the collective condition to the response or the investigation of truth is definitely better than it has been in the past. Okay. However, the collective moral condition of humanity, humanity right at this moment is much worse than it has been in times in the past. Okay. okay. So there's no... So over that, those 16 um, periods of... Seven periods of 16,000 years, sorry, if you like, 16, around about, yeah. yes. So yeah. 130,000 years or so. There hasn't been like a slow sort of uh, increase in in soul condition of humanity, it's been... Um, there was a degradation in the condition initially of humanity and humanity went down into such a poor condition that the average person on earth lived from 20 to 30 years of age. And that's their full extent of their life on earth. And they passed in a condition where they were little better than an animal in terms of what they would understand with regard to tr any truth. And then through the feed, through the channeling of information that was more positive coming from the spirit world, so once the spirits have reached the sixth dimension of the spirit world, from that point on, humanity began a very slow rise of condition over a period of time. Now bear in mind, this is the condition of openness to truth, not necessarily the moral condition. Does that make sense? Um, so for example, humanity reached um, in times past a very, very good moral condition in, before some of these major cataclysmic events occurred. Such a good moral condition that some spirits could even materialise on Earth. And, um, but unfortunately, the spirits who materialised on Earth caused the degradation of Earth again, and then it went downhill very rapidly after that. So, so we've had these cycles occur. So you could say there's these cycles occurring like this, but the general there is a general improvement over hundreds of thousands, over now tens of thousands of years of general improvement, to such a point now that many of us can speak openly, like we are now speaking today, where 60 or 70 people can meet together openly and discuss matters of truth that are generally quite confronting to the world in, you know, around us, but we can do it in relative safety without somebody coming in and murdering us, and, uh, whereas, whereas that's not always been possible in the past. Does that make sense? Well, just for the time being, up to today anyway, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the time of the witches, there was a lot of murdering the women. Were they also were involved with dark spirits in that time? Yes, uh, this cycle that I have described so, to you yeah. of uh, dark spirits and bright spirits influencing the planet has happened many times through history. And unfortunately, the Dark Ages were one of these times where, where, there was an, uh, where our presence on Earth in the first century caused a lot of light to appear on the Earth. Unfortunately, that light got distorted over a period of a few hundred years until such a point that certain people, the priesthood again, took control of this light and then, and then packaged it in, in a manner that was out of harmony with truth, of course. But in the process of packaging it, they made specific rules and put in place specific rules. Some of the rules were, again, relating to mediumship. And mm. one of the rules was that if you were basically a medium, then you were an agent of the devil. Mm. And, uh, 
And so, so what they did was they, dis they discouraged prophecy through that, through that process. So what happened around 300 uh, or so um, was that there were these general rules that were placed upon the Christian society at the time, which I wouldn't call that Christian because many of them were highly violent, warmongering people at the time. But, uh, but they, um, they placed these rules on society and the blackout, I suppose you could call it, there was a deep blackout of spirit communication for many, many hundreds of years um, where any person who was involved in spirit communication was generally murdered uh, for, if, if, if it became known publicly. Yeah. Thank you. And they were eventually later called witches and burned alive generally. Uh, or they had what were called tests put upon them which were impossible to survive. And if you survived the test, then you were said to be an agent of the devil and you were murdered anyway. And if you died during the test, then you, then you were said to be innocent. Mm. Yeah. But Thank you can't. died anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So um, either way, there wasn't much of a hope of new truth being given to the earth during that That's time. Really now, of course, many of our spirit friends, including ourselves, yeah. during that time were trying to enlighten people on earth. And this began to happen during what's called the Reformation. Uh, it's a period during the, the late 1400s, early 1500s, and then from, from then on, um, we managed to connect to people uh, who were spir spiritual people, who were learned men, and we helped them read some of the verses that were in the Bible that pertain to love. And many of them started to discover truths about love as a result of that. And they then decided to start new religious faiths, which were more loving than the past one. And uh, many of them died, unfortunately, through this process. But uh, the fortunate thing that occurred during that process was that we, we had more truth able to be given to the earth. And therefore, in the, instead of the Catholic religion maintaining its hold upon the Christian faith, we had many, a dispersal of many faiths then occurred from that point in time, all of whom started to incorporate other principles of love into the faith which improved the condition of humanity on the earth. Does that make sense? Thank you. So can you see how mediumship has taken... Uh, like it's been a very, very important part of the development of truth on the planet. A very important part. It also has been a very important part of the development of a lot of I I what we call iniquities on the planet. A lot of very negative events on the planet. Can you see that here's a gift, a potential that all of us have a communi to communicate with spirits and yet it can be used for a huge amount of good or it can be used for a huge amount of bad. And the question that we've got to ask ourselves if we're actually performing mediumship ourselves for other people is we've got to best start asking ourselves sincerely, are we performing it for one, which one of those two things? Good or bad? Can you see that? Yeah. Rachel was just sorry. Rachel was just saying to me that um, mediumship is happening all the time, everywhere, mm -hmm. amongst all of us. Um, that many of the great discoveries on Earth and inventions, um, music, um, construction, it, many things have been inspired by the guidance of spirits. Um, she was saying, though, that um, it does that the reason why that happens so effectively often, often is because a person's will and desire is actually in harmony with love and a desire for more truth. Mm. And so she was saying that it often gets very murky when we start to formally do mediumship because there's other emotions that come into play. Mm. But if, if we remember that the... Um, the initial um, focus of a pure will or a pure desire is what usually enables the most pure purity in mediumship. That that um, that would ensure that we're all great mediums when we tried to do it formally. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, just wait for the mic, please. I know I have an error around this, but this is why I want to ask. Um, I, um, the 
the, the concept of new ideas and inspiration, um, is that all of that, does all of that come from spirits or can we actually think up new things ourselves? Thank you. Um, it's quite obvious the answer, isn't it? What, what's the answer? If a new idea can come from a spirit, then a new idea can certainly come from yourself. Because it isn't a spirit, just a person. So, so the reality is that new ideas can come from any individual who's ever been created, whether they are living on Earth or in the spirit world. Unfortunately, because of our emotional blockages on Earth, most of the new ideas that happen on Earth are not our own because we are emotionally blocked to the inspirational parts of ourselves, to the creative parts of ourselves. So a lot of the new ideas that happen on Earth are actually coming from spirits uh, transmitted to us. However, in the spirit world, almost every new idea that's ever conceived comes from the heart of, an, of a person in the spirit world, in, including the whole understanding of divine truth came from mine. So, so you, do you understand? Like every, so every single person is totally capable of having inspiration come from within themselves. But to do that, you have to be in a quite a pure space when it comes to your creative desires. The problem that we have on Earth is that most of us are not in a pure space when it comes to our creative desires, and so therefore we often need to have inspiration from an external source. Mm. Thank you. Does that make sense, Teresa? Yeah. Yep. yep. So all of you are totally capable of discovering something new that nobody else has ever discovered. Yeah. Which is awesome, isn't it? But, but all of us are also totally capable of influencing other peoples with our discovery. <laughs> Which is what basically a spirit does when he discovers something new. He goes, oh, I've discovered that new thing new. Oh, it would be really handy down there on Earth. <laughs> so let's go and talk to, oh, there's somebody. I taught him. He, he's pretty open to that. So, you know, a lot of the n n truths about electrical transmission of energy. Well, Tesla was a man who began a lot of those truths uh, or was an instrumental part in a lot of those truths because he was taught to by spirits constantly. If you read his biography, you will actually find that he was all the time being influenced by spirits of all different types. And, and in fact, the people around him were often quite confused with him because he often seemed quite disturbed um, because of the amount of different influences he was under at the time. But he had a passion to discover new things and in engaging his passion, other spirits came to him and guided and helped guide those passions into something that was positive. And in fact, right now, we're using electrical energy in the manner that he, d he discovered. So we're using what's called alternate current, an alternating current form of energy here in our, in our auditorium. And uh, he discovered that use of current. Before then there was only direct current. So he, he was an instrumental part in how we live our life today. And he hasn't been forgotten because very recently there was a new song um, written about him. Yep. And it, the, the line says, you know, Nicola, we've got to make a difference. Yep. And it's just released fairly recently, so he yeah. hasn't been forgotten at all. And he was in quite a good space in the sense of he desired to improve humanity's condition through the use of energy. And this is one reason why he could, he could connect with spirits who had completely different ways of looking at electrical energy than what was currently the, you know, the, the pervading beliefs on Earth, the, the, the standard beliefs on Earth at the time. Yeah, and he was also very, very concerned about the transmission of free energy. He, he, he felt the world would greatly benefit from free energy, but unfortunately, due to a number of different things that happened, uh, we now have metered energy, where people charge you for the delivery of the energy. So um, he also had at least schematics for something called a death ray. Um, would that have been his own stuff or would that be lower spirits also jumping on the bandwagon? Well, this is where almost every person who has ever been um, 
inspired by spirits in a positive direction has generally at some point in their life also been inspired by spirits in a negative direction. And, uh, and in fact, many scientific discoveries have been completely inspired by very, very dark spirits. Uh, so, for example, mankind needed to discover uh, things like radioactive material and the splitting of the atom and those kind of things. We need to discover those things for our own progress. However, uh, many dark spirits got involved in the discovery of those particular things. And, of course, it, it, its first use was not to do with the production of energy, but rather to destroy quite a few hundred thousand people, which, which is very sad. But that's the first use. That was the first use of the negative transmission of information from the spirit world about radioactivity and atomic, uh, atomic information. Is, in that case, someone like Einstein, is he soul-wise held responsible at all for E equals MC squared? Um, is Einstein held responsible? Yeah, because he was part of that process of, of making the knowledge available at all. No, I don't see the relationship, Alexis. I, I think you're being quite distorted how you see things if you feel that way. No, I'm just wondering um, in terms but, but, of... But why would what? you wonder that a man like Einstein, who had a very pure desire to see peace on the earth, discovers a scientific truth yeah. that he then because of his love for people, gives to others, they then begin using it in a negative manner. How could he then re be responsible for that? Can you see that your fear is in there, yeah. in that question? Sure, yeah. you're, you're afraid of discovering something new and you're giving it to somebody else and then they use it badly and then somehow you'll be to blame. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah, not the yeah, case. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that happened yeah. actually. God, God attributes <laughs> the uh, results... Uh, to the people who make the decisions out of harmony with love, not to the people who make the decisions in harmony with love. Yeah. Right? So you right now could discover a scientific truth which has the potential to destroy half the population. Right? <laughs> but if that scientific truth, if you give it to the world uh, from a condition of love, then, then you are completely absolved from any, uh, anything to do with how the world then uses that particular information. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so can we see already the use of mediumship? There, there is a responsibility. Can you see that? Um, every one of us has the ability, and many of us do on a daily basis, as, as Rachel pointed out, on a daily basis, you do connect to spirits. Many of you are not even aware when you're being connect, connecting to spirits, and so you don't call it mediumship. You just call it, oh, I come up with a good idea then. That's what you call it. Or, oh, that was a wonderful idea. Oh, that happened really nice. Uh, my soul is pretty powerful when it's not actually your soul, but somebody, somebody in the spirit world helping you out. Um, and many times we do take uh, credit for, for something that we believe is ourself when the reality is that it's a spirit who's actually given us or helped us with that information. The key thing now, though, that we'd like to discuss with you is what the spirits who are of a higher condition see when they see many of you engaging in mediumship. Can that, does that make sense? Now, I've described to you uh, in the past how every unhealed emotion that you have is like a... there is like a cord of energy coming out of you. And remember, I've described it to you, it's like a hook going out, like tentacles going out, waiting to engulf somebody. <laughs> right? And if that person is accepting the tentacles of I've got going out, then bang, that person is in the engulfment of this emotional addiction. Now, what we would like to do now is describe to you, and if I can involve the, the guys here, if we can describe to you what some of these things or hooks look like in terms of how they see them, so that you can begin to see what's really going on in many cases. Right? So, so let's say a person just has a desire and it's a pure desire to, for mediumship. Now, can, what colour does that look like from, from, uh, from coming out of the soul of a person? Let's, we'll, we'll see how accurate we are. Accurate. Let's both uh, get a, get a colour. Oh, I get orange. I get like a 
<coughs> pinky, um, corally kind of a colour. Yeah, so, yeah. It's an orange coral sort of yeah. pink, uh, a very uh, sort of like if we can point out in the audience. Yeah, sort of similar to Philippa's top. Similar yeah. to Philippa's top. That's no, a bit different. Does that make sense? Now, let's say the desire for mediumship is now tinged with the desire for glory or power. What does it now look like? Well, it immediately loses its uh, brilliance. So no longer is it this bright, corally, uh, sort of pinky orange colour? Just It becomes like a murky brown, like khaki kind of... So if we can point out somebody else's uh, colour, who's got it <laughs> in there? Uh, um, that even has too much colour. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of like your pants <laughs> there, yeah. just off black. Um, sort of a greyish brown, that's what they look like to me at the moment, <laughs> from here anyway. Um, or the dress, yeah, not maybe. far off the dress yeah. there. Yeah. And a bit like, um, no, that's at the front, the skirt. The, your skirt, yeah, that's yeah. it. Something a bit like that um, colour. And the jumper with the stripes. The yeah. jumper with the stripes, yes. Um, that's more like it, actually, yeah. Yeah, so yeah I see yes, more like the yes. with the jumper with the stripes. Yes, yeah, same. Like that colour. Yeah. So you want to stand up for us? Yeah. Yes, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So can you see the difference between those colours? Yeah. L like, you don't even see them as the same colour, right? <laughs> and, and so what we need to understand is that as soon as something is tinged with an emotion that's out of harmony with love, it turns from this beautiful, bright, brilliant colour into this real murky, totally different type of colour. And, and the spirit sees the difference. Now, if you're a spirit who's motivated by purity only, what colour would you be on the lookout for? So you'd be look out, on the lookout for the coral, orangey-pink colour, wouldn't you? Right? Now, if you were a spirit who was only interested in the misuse of um, the mediumship, what would you be on the, and the addictive use of it, what colour would you be looking for? Can you see? You'd be looking for that murky colour. Can you see the difference? Um, Rachel's just saying that it's as if there are many celestial beings surrounding the earth, always waiting for the opportunity to connect with one of you. And it is the colour, it is not so much that we seek the colour but are attracted to the colour. Mm. Um, and it is always with great joy that we are able to connect, um, to take that opportunity to connect. Sadly, very often, it is a colour that changes quickly. Um, and often it is when people are in a deep sense of crisis or despair that we... Um, and their desire for truth becomes far more clear and clarified that we are able to connect very strongly. And then the colour coming from them looks like Paulus... Uh, Philippus. Philippus top. Yeah. 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 Um, sadly for many of you, the colour exists. It glimmers for moments, but because of the, um, the unwillingness to experience or to even acknowledge the impurities in your desires, it quickly shifts. Um, the colour becomes distorted very quickly. And changes more to Lenoria's colour. Yeah. So with the with Lenoria's colour, it's Lenoria. It is Lenoria's. Lenaria. No. no. Lenaria. Sorry. Lenaria, with Lenaria's colour, um, what what do you feel when you feel that colour? Uh, we we it is uh, just as the um, brilliant colour of the pure desire is has a feeling is has a has a feeling, a warmth and an attraction for us, this sudden change in colour is like a slamming of a door. It is cold, harsh, and we are repelled. Um, now, if we could also describe there is a smell associated with each colour in the spirit world. So what does the, if we can try to describe, I know it's difficult, the smell associated with the colour 
of Philippa's talk, where we've got a pure desire for mediumship. This is very difficult. This is a very <coughs> crude, I will give a crude analogy, because as you are aware, the sense of smell is so heightened and um, complex here in spirit form. But if we may crudely say that the pure desire for um, truthful and loving spirit connection would resemble the smell of rose petals, the, um, the opposing addictive desire <clears throat> smells putrid, uh, like rotting fruit, rotting food, rotting matter. So what type of spirit would be, a, 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 be attracted to the rotting food uh, smell <laughs> and, and uh, colour? Sadly, this would be our brothers and sisters who uh, live in conditions of darkness surrounding the earth, those who wish to avoid their deepest pains and shames, these ones who uh, sadly try to avoid this, um, this smell or sense about themselves through connecting with others. Okay, let's ask some questions. So let's come down to... Just, sorry, down. Yep, that's it. Rachel, does that mean that each of those dimensions actually smell like those colours all the time? If everybody's yes. matching that level... Uh, if you could imagine, the, um, each sphere which we traverse is a complete sensory experience. It not just has uh, a smell or a sight, but our own spirit bodies feel particular ways within the spheres that we, that we traverse through our development. So yes, um, those in um, hellish conditions uh, um, experience a smell around them, but also they feel repulsed by the smell of their own condition. Um, so remembering that the condition reflected <clears throat> around a person is indicative of their own soul and spirit condition. The smell is, in fact, they perceive it as coming from the surroundings, but it is, in fact, belonging to their own condition. So would that not be something that would start to stimulate them to change? Or? As with everything in God's universe, um, all things are geared towards the stimulus of change towards love. But yes. if you want to believe that it's something outside of yourself that's creating that smell, then you're not probably going to look at yourself, are you, first? Just as many of you would prefer to look at those things outside of yourselves and blame them um, for, the, for the sadness and unhappiness that you feel, this is not a condition unique to you while you have a physical body. After passing, that same injury stays with many people and they prefer to blame their surroundings for their discomfort, for their, the, the smell, for their, for their lack of peace and happiness. When, as you rightly point out, God has designed everything that we would begin to, to look within us to what injury may be creating these situations. So the whole universe is geared for you to look internally but unfortunately, the majority of us are very resistive to that. And so whenever anything's unpleasant, we blame something externally. So then is it difficult for a celestial spirit to enter the hells to try and help? Or is it... No. No. Um, uh, let me be more detailed in this answer. Um, it is true that the conditions within the hells are in very much discord with our own condition. Um, we do not resonate with anything within the hells once we have reached such a closeness with God. And so it is, um, perhaps you could say, it is not our desire to be there um, just to pass the time. <laughs> it is the loving desire that draws us to these locations. And we do uh, have to alter some of our, our own um, connection with um, 
God. That is not the correct way to say it, but this is the way that Mary can. If I can it. explain it, perhaps, because um, I think Mary's going to struggle with this. But um, it, what has to happen is you you detune your sensory apparatus, if you like, in your spirit body, as you enter the hells. If you're a celestial spirit, you detune the senses where everything, you observe everything, and if you choose to smell it, you can still smell it but it has no effect on you. It does not enter you, nor does it infiltrate your spirit body's condition or your soul condition. And this is also... But it's still present. What we wish to say, we have an awareness of the, um, the filth and the smell of the conditions surrounding us. But as each of you will experience, as you progress in love, this love also affords you uh, more... Tolerance of such things. These things are not your preference, but you do not feel such a need to um, reject or resist. Uh. Maybe if I can give a physical illustration. It's a bit like imagine if there was a rotting carcass uh, at the, at, dropped at your front door full of maggots. Right? And um, many of us would open the front door and see the rotting carcass full of maggots and smell it. And we would be, what? What would what would we do? You'd be like, oh, oh, shocking! You'd rave on and carry on about how bad it is, and I've got to fix this straight up. And you put on masks, and you put on clothes, and you put on gloves, and away you go and try to get rid of the mess. Right? That's what you would do. Right? Now, a celestial spirit doesn't respond to the same to it the same way. A celestial spirit would would see it for as it is. And, uh, but, but not feel so uh, internally repelled by the experience. Does that make sense? For it is viewed with eyes of love. Mm. There is a, a, not a, a, in the example that you give, there is an acknowledgement of the animal which has um, been a part of, which is a part of God's creation, the process of decay which is occurring, which is also a part of God's creation. Um, and there is a, a respect for all of these processes. But please keep in mind, as I say this, this is not an intellectual um, way of distancing ourselves from this process. It is more an encompassing um, feeling of love for the entire process. And because of that feeling of love, the smells and the tastes and the other things that bombard you, are not, they don't enter you because of the feelings that you have of love that basically combat the... Uh, it's a very difficult... It's, combat's probably not and the right word either. But. There is, if we now relate this analogy to our service to those in the hellish spheres, there is a sense of love for the condition that the person finds themselves in. Mm. There is a compassion. There is a, a complete understanding of the situations which have led this person to be in this state. Again, many of you are tempted to consider this in an intellectual fashion and generate compassion. However, it is for ourselves a feeling of love which encompasses all of these things simultaneously, which means that we do not feel repulsion for the person or their situation. More it is this loving desire that we would connect with them in, in the state that they are in and assist them, yeah. which means that we do not um, find it so horrific to be in the hells. Can, can I also point out too that uh, many of us in your mediumship nights that you do, many of you, um, when you hear a spirit talk or hear a spirit in a poor condition come to speak, you have feelings towards that spirit that are very, very dark. So you'll often have feelings of rage or anger towards the spirit, or you'll have feelings where you laugh at the spirit, where you think it's quite humorous that the spirit's going through pain that you don't understand and why they're doing it, and so forth. Now, these are not the feelings that a celestial spirit has for those particular people. And, and this is where our mediumship and night, mediumship nights can become very out of harmony with love very rapidly. So, so we've got to be very careful about that. You want to comment about that? Uh, because simply, Angelo would want to comment too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and perhaps my brother Angelo is better to speak upon this topic. However, 
we wish to say that there are many of us present as you gather um, on these nights to speak with spirits. However, our ability to assist those spirits and yourselves is severely impeded by this lack of desire to serve um, serve anyone other than yourselves through these gatherings. When each of you develop more of a sincere desire to assist those around you, but also assist those in these lower spheres, we are able to act far more um, immediately and meaningfully in terms of the guidance that we may provide to yourselves and to those who are struggling to leave these dark conditions. Mm. Angela, would like to yeah, yeah, can we add Angela? <coughs> With the Thursday night mediumship that happens at Kyabra, often a brave spirit comes to visit. And that brave spirit, who's in a courageous moment, has come, is surrounded by many other spirits who are in part of that group or watching. As soon as there's any condemnation to that spirit, those other spirits then leave. And instead of just helping many, we start to only help one or two or a few. Hmm. In fact, those spirits who come to you on these evenings display a great deal of humility. And this is a point that many of you neglect. That they, uh, when I say a great deal of humility, what I actually said was, <laughs> they display more humility than those in the group. Can I, can I sort of ask, illustrate how? Yes. Um, many of you in the group would not openly talk about your life to a heap of strangers... Who have a sense of ridicule. ..who have a sense of ridicule about your life. Is that not true? And yet many of these spirits are coming to you, talking openly about their life, risking your ridicule. So that tells us that they are already more humble than you are. And yet you laugh at them. Can it's you the, see the... It's their desire to know more that brings them. And there's an opportunity that they bring all those around them at the same time. Mm. And generally at the moment what happens is we only help a few rather than many. And Rachel wanted to say a little more. Uh, there is a, an, in, an essential um, ingredient to loving mediumship is the respect and honour of those that you communicate with. This is the, the most uh, meaningful, oftentimes the, the way that we make connection with those in darker conditions than ourselves is through the love that we display to those in spirit. So if we may um, draw the comparison between our work in the celestial realms helping um, people in lower spheres to your um, exercises in mediumship here on Earth. The way that we approach the assistance of others in lower spheres is through having a deep honour and respect for each person as a child of God who has had a unique life's experience which has led them to whichever point we meet them at. For yourselves, there is often still this deep delineation between yourselves in the flesh and those in spirit. You believe them, you often neglect the fact that these are people who have had a unique life experience, one that you have the opportunity to begin to understand but do not understand at the beginning of your interactions with them. And without holding this sense of respect and honour for them as a child of God and in that way you're equal, this lessens the rapport that you are able to establish with them severely. Is this clear? Yes, I feel so. Hmm. Just ask a question. So. so is it true then that, um, that we can be a great instrument because we're sort of closer to the lower spheres and because in my mind there's all that talk and all this worry about I'm not, um, you know, I'm not ad, um, developed in love enough to do this, um, but is it really the willingness to do it? Certainly. Um, many of you neglect the issue of 
um, you use these words as a way of avoiding um, the fact that a sincere desire to be of service of others is the most vital ingredient to being of service of others. Um, the, this, this sense that I'm not of the right development is actually a way to avoid um, a desire to assist a brother or a sister. Mm. Um, and in fact, it is this desire to be of service in a pure sense that does heighten one's development greatly. So many of you become engrossed and embroiled in many issues surrounding your childhoods and um, your own desire to hold on to anger. And is this desire to hold on to anger, which means very few of you have a sincere desire to be of service. It is very difficult to hold on to a sense of righteous anger and desire to serve those around you. Uh, if each of you were to... Um, consider and pray about this issue within yourselves, you would be far better prepared once you release this sense of... It is not even to release the entirety of your anger, but to come to see the truth about your anger, that it is not righteous, and also the truth that each of us has the ability right now to serve another person around us. At the moment, many, many people we observe on the planet um, believe just the opposite truths, that they are righteous in their anger and that they have no ability to serve others. If, if the world were to come into more of a sense of truth, that no anger is righteous and that each of us has the ability to serve immediately, um, many great issues would be resolved upon the planet and we ourselves as celestial beings would be able to serve through this pure uh, desire to serve that one of you may hold. We could serve also in conjunction with you. If I can add too, it's very difficult for many of our celestial friends, and we make it very difficult for our celestial friends, to be able to assist the earth. And the reason why we make it difficult is because we don't have a pure desire to serve and so they can't then request our assistance in getting certain things done that need to be done for, for the earth to change. When some of us, all, we, we barely even have to change our own condition to get into a desire to serve. This, this, this is, is a wonderful thing. This is the point we wish to make strongly. Mm. And once this pure desire to serve exists in the heart of an individual, um, many of you would be shocked to see how rapid um, a celestial being is able to join with that person, how rapidly this association occurs, mm. and how exponential um, the potentials be grow, how exponentially they grow in terms of the value and the quality and the scope of the service. Many of you look around you in your lives and some of you have big dreams of how you would wish to serve and change the world. And yet you see yourselves from the limited viewpoint of where you sit now and the resources that you have now. We say to you, if you were just to trust this very pure, um, sincere desire to serve, if you were to grow this within yourselves, there is a great amount that we would be able to do to assist you because when one person has the pure desire to serve in their heart and they begin to act on this desire, they are no longer one person uh, serving. There are many of us who join immediately. Yeah. But we are only enabled to join by, having, by this um, prerequisite condition within the soul of the individual, which is the sincere desire to serve, mm -hmm. as our brother said. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. So does everyone understand... That I feel if you look at our practical situation, many times we have these gatherings, right, where there's 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 people together, it is still very difficult for myself and Mary to find a person who is willing to hand the microphone around. Now, that's because the majority of us don't have a desire to serve. We have a desire to sit there and absorb or we're afraid. You know, we're afraid of doing that job. Or we have, which is a really being self-absorbed, or we have a desire to sit down and enjoy, but without having to have any sharing and participating with making it happen. 
And uh, this, these are examples in our day-to-day, -day, you know, even in our own interactions, where the desire to serve are not present. This is why you often find exactly the same people doing exactly the same things, because they are the people who do have a desire to serve. They have, they, they're not desiring to serve me. They're desiring to serve you. Does that make sense? So when Igor does the stuff for, to, to put on the internet, it doesn't benefit me, him doing that. At all. I already know the material. I don't even watch it. <laughs> right? He, he, he's doing it for you. And, and because of that, some celestial spirits can connect to him and help him and guide him through that process. Does that make sense? And that's just an example of, of what they're saying. You want to add, Rachel? Uh, no, yes. <laughs> Um, just in reference to the initial question um, by, the, by the audience member, which was about the, um, the feeling that one is not in the correct development to begin to serve through mediumship. Um, we simply wish to add to this that it is not... Um, that if, if one has two vital ingredients they are able to use their mediumship in great, with a great deal of love and effectiveness. Mm. One is this pure desire to serve, which we, initially, which we have outlined. Mm. The second is your own humility. If you are able to remain humble in your dealings with spirits, if you do not feel that you must have all of the answers, but instead are open to the guidance and inspiration which is already with you through your sincere desire to be of service, if you are willing to be humble to the own errors and injuries which exist within yourself and discuss these with the spirit also, even your own trials and your own um, problems with overcoming anger can assist a spirit greatly to have a higher level of self-awareness of, of their own troubles with anger, for example. Um, and also, within that communication, one of the many celestial brothers and sisters who wish to assist not only the spirit but also yourself is able to provide far more inspiration. But it is not only the desire to be of service but your own humility to the issues which exist within yourself which will enable this to um, flow smoothly. And perhaps the other third uh, fairly important ingredient too is to understand that mediumship doesn't only occur when you sit down and try to do mediumship. So whenever you are in a passionate desire of your own, so let's say you had a passionate desire to do music and you had a passionate desire to serve and you had a passionate desire to stay humble, in that place, uh, many celestial spirits can connect to you and inspire you with lyrics and songs and the, the actual writing of the music and all of these other things can be inspired, which will actually benefit thousands, if not millions, of persons, potentially. And so, so you could say that your passion and desire, your humility and your desire to serve now combine to attract a spirit with very similar passions and desires, with a similar desire for humility and a desire to serve, and... Together, you now have the ability to create something that will affect the entire world. Right? Now, unfortunately, when we start doing things that have the ability to affect the entire world, many of us then flick into the impure desire to serve. So in other words, now we're doing it because we're self-serving. We, we want glory, attention, approval. We want people to say that we did it all and all those kind of things. And now we've gone from that pure coral to the very dark brown and the putrid smelling thing. And of course now all of that cooperative effort that could be assisted through these spirit interactions, all of those good spirits have to step back from us. And then what other spirit, spirits are going to step in? All of those dark spirits will step in and then they will use your impure desire and your lack of humility and your inability to, um, to do it to serve others and they will use that for their own ends in a negative way. Can you see how it can go from one to the other quite rapidly if we're not careful and if we don't work through our emotional issues? 
Alexis? Hi, AJ. Um, for me, desire to serve is a, is a really confusing issue um, because I um, spent years as a monk intellectually in that space where literally every day of my life I was in service. Yeah. Um, and it was really, in theory, not about anything that I owned or anything. Um, saying that I felt like that was just like I was doing a path. Yeah. It wasn't this genuine feeling. So who were you serving? Um, perhaps myself, I don't know, you know, like it could yeah. have been. But my, my question is, is more currently, I, I still don't feel this, this feeling like, oh, I want to go out of my way to serve, yep. you know, and that's good. the reality. And it's um, good to admit that. Yeah. But um, can I point out to many of you, yeah. and not just yourself, Alexis, but many in the audience have this problem. You are actually in an angry place about service. Uh -huh. and, and when you say you don't have a desire to serve, the reality is, unfortunately, even a little worse than that. Okay. There is, a, there is a strong feeling inside of many of us that we do not want to serve anybody. We're sick of serving anybody. <laughs> We're sick of having to do that. And when you start connecting with the emotion, you start feeling all of that rage inside that says, I'm not going to do that. Why should I have to do that? And, and that's the real feeling that we actually have. Yeah. And what our celestial friends would like to encourage you to do is to actually address that emotion. So to, to actually go through the process of feeling the rage of that emotion, feeling the fear that's under it, and, and there are fears under it, and there's a, quite a lot of grief about why we feel that way too. Because yeah. a lot of times we've been forced to do things in the past, or we've done things in the past thinking that they're good when they haven't turned out good for us or for others. And so we have a lot of fears and also grief to feel about service. And this is one of the reasons why we're actually resistive to the desire to serve. The truth is... When you connect with a pure desire to serve, you receive so much joy from it that it's very, very hard to resist. Mm. Like, so if we're not receiving joy from, a de from our desire to serve, it's because of our rage about what's happened in our past. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, was going to say... Um, um, how to say, when, when somebody asks me for help, I feel fine with it, but it's it's different. I'm feeling like there's uh, there's like even with the mediumship thing. I, well, with the mediumship thing, it's almost a little different. Where I start to feel everything the spirit feels, and it feels so horrible that I feel like I just got to deal with this. You know, so it's it's still a reluctance. So actually. so can you see there is an underlying reluctance which yeah. which needs to be addressed. Yeah. But but can you also see inside of you there's still this spark of compassion that drives yeah, your service. Yeah. When I feel right? that, I, I really so want to help. When them. you feel that compassion start to grow, yeah. Then your desire to service increases. So yeah. so what is the impediment? The impediment is still the rage and the anger. The, the what's happened in the past with regard to service mm -hmm. that that needs to be released from from you. And, and the majority of people we find are actually in that condition where they will not admit to them, even to themselves, that reality is they do want to come to, to one of these events and just be able to sit there and enjoy the whole thing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Rather than do anything. Um, and when you think about our day-to-day -day life, can you see even in our day-to-day -day life we often have this expectation, like where, you know, we... We, we like to have somebody else make the meal for us. We don't like to make the meal for somebody else. Like how many of you ladies would love your husbands to make a meal for you? And that's probably never happened for some of you for, for as long as you can remember. Um, and, and that's because the man in that case does not have the desire to serve. He, he just wants to just sit there and absorb what's given to him. And, and there are many circumstances in our lives where we actually have this. Where, where really it's an anger going out to our environment. Like, and what we're really saying to our environment is, I want all of you. And in a way, it's very arrogant. It's sort of, I want all of you plebs to serve me. It's really how we feel many of the times, right? Mm. But, but, but what we need to do is go, okay, that is very, for a start, it's very arrogant and not very self-responsible <laughs> position. 
But once we truly connect with some compassion for everybody around us, we'll go, oh, wow, I'd like to be able to help this person that way. So, so you notice somebody who's having a struggle with their family and you know how to sort, sort out some of those issues, you might just offer your assistance. Now, they might reject you, and many of us are afraid of rejection, so we don't even offer. Um, and this is why we wait till somebody asks, because we're afraid of the potential of rejection. Our celestial friends are not really afraid of the potential of rejection. They're not afraid of it at all. Right? Many of them get rejected every day. And they still offer. <laughs> Does that make sense? Many of them have been rejected every day from you. <laughs> this is what and they, they still said. offer. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. We, uh, we wish to point out that many of you have, um, in your lives... Um, begun to have a distorted sense of what it is to serve. Because of you, for many of you in your life experience, many things have been demanded of you. And in your service, it has, um, you have been obliged to serve. But you have also been obliged by your families and your environment to deny your very selves, your very true natures. And um, for many of you now, this, this idea of service is attached with many... Um, issues which you have a great deal of grief about, the denial of yourself, the denial of your own personality, the desire of your denial of your desires, hard work, and the only um, benefit many of you have felt from service has been the receiving of approval. Now, for ourselves, we are not attached to the sense of approval because we understand that service is an expression of our true selves and our true desires, that it comes from a deep sense of passion within ourselves. Um, and that is why when we are rejected, there is very little sorrow involved, especially after at one minute there is no sorrow. Um, but as you develop, you will begin to experience these um, situations where you connect with more of a pure desire to serve, which is grounded within yourself and your own personality, you will begin to serve and all of those old griefs or any impurities in the desire will be confronted in you and there may be some sadness to feel as you progress. However, the more you progress, the more you will find that service is a very invigorating uh, pastime uh, once you align yourself with the loving understanding of what service is and once love motivates you in this love and not addiction motivates you in your desire to serve. So perhaps if I can give another example, a practical one, where let's say you have a desire to serve humanity by um, using your music as an art to give to people. So you start developing that by practising your music and you practise your presentation so you have an engaging presentation and so forth. And the very first gig that you do, you get up and, uh, and you go there expecting that somebody is going to listen to you and you go there and not a single person comes. Now, a person who's in their true passion and desire would actually look at that and they'd go, wow, I must have wanted people, expected people to come. Otherwise, there'd be people here. Um, now, there's obviously something wrong going on with my passion and desire here. Now, they can use that opportunity to refine it in that moment and then change it again. Uh, Fab just told me of, a, of uh, some recent experiences he's had with that, where he went along to a pub with a lot of judgement about people getting drunk and alcohol and so forth, and he went along to a pub to pay a gig and, uh, and nobody listened. And nobody even was there. Were they? Hardly anybody was there. They, they all just went away from you, and nobody listened. And so Fab was just playing and singing there with with no audience. Right? Then he realised what was going on, and connected to the same desire to serve which he had before then, but this time connected to it more purely by dealing with some emotions about what he was expecting from the audience. And what he, one of some of the things he was expecting were wanting them to like his songs or wanting them to give him approval and those kind of emotions. He worked through some of that and then he realised that if he really loved them, he would think about what they would like and prepare some things about what they would like. So what he did was he got together a heap of old uh, love songs <laughs> that you like, that you're passionate about, 
and that you thought that you know that might connect to them. There was also his guides realized, of course, in this process that yeah, sad men go to drink because they're sad about love, right? So there's also a bit of that external influence now. So he practices a lot of these love songs, and a lot of them are there liking heavy metal and other things, but he goes along with these soft love songs and sits down and starts playing them, and this time, instead of judging the audience, he's coming from this point of wanting to give to them something, right? And now they all gather around him listening, and, you know, like, why is that? Because he's now refined his desire to give. The problem we face with our mediumship is often we're not doing any of that. We're not doing the refining process. Right? So what, what we're doing is we, we notice the spirit who comes to us and we go, oh, that was a very nasty spirit. I don't like him very much. Oh, boy, he's pretty... And we have all this judgment, not realising in that very moment we're often darker than the spirit is that we're trying, who's come to us for assistance. And, and so we're often in that moment way, way out of harmony of any self-reflection. This is where I feel um, Pete is very humble in that he has decided he wants to serve through his mediumship and he puts himself up in front of all of you and, and faces not only the spirits but also any feelings that are amongst the group. And he's also constantly desiring feedback on his own, how clear he is with Angelo. And he's talking to Angelo all, all the time, all throughout his day, desiring to understand more their connection and, and what he can learn from Angelo. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, I feel that's like a, a very... Um, shows more pure desire to serve when we're willing to take risks in our service. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If we come down to Susan... Just a little bit on that refinement, um, Yeshua. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of mediumship since lately and um, I've noticed from the feedback that there are elements of my own injuries within that mediumship. And I was just... Uh, is that for us to really work on as a result of that, for the purity to come through or more purity to come through? Yes, yeah, so it's important to understand in particular with the gift of mediumship but actually with any gift that we have mm -hmm. that we often begin it with a lot of impure desires and, uh, but, but often there is this seed, this underlying spark or seed of true passionate desire in, intermingled with these other impure desires. And so what happens when we embrace the process, if we're humble to see, then we will actually see many things about what's going on if we embrace the process of doing what we desire. So in Fab's case with the music, embraces a process, gets some feedback, knows that he's got to do something himself, deals with that thing, goes back and tries the same thing again, and this time it's a completely different outcome. Now, it's exactly the same with our mediumship. We embrace our process, embrace the desire. Often some spirits will come to us who are a mirror of our own emotional injuries, right? Or are, have some kind of compatibility with our, or sympathy with our own emotional injuries. And, and if we're sitting there judging them, in the reality, all we're doing is sitting there judging ourselves because we're the ones who attracted them in the first place to talk with us. And so what we need to do is go, OK, this time I've, 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 I've... Oh, again, I've got a very angry woman with me. Mm, that's very interesting. And why, do they, why do these angry women find it so easy to speak through me? You know, now, there, there can only be one of two possible explanations, probably. One is that we are very angry, and so they find it very easy. Or one is that we're very afraid of very angry women, and they find it very easy. Um, and we need to be self-analytical and examine that. And if we deal with that and examine that, that in a loving manner, instead of condemning the spirit we've attracted, if we deal with it in a loving manner, then we're, of course, going to have a very, very different outcome. What I find happening a lot is that people are con condemning the spirits that are with them. In fact, many of you ha have been very angry and rageful with the spirits who you've attracted into your life not understanding that you attracted them. Not understanding that it's something you do inside of your condition that attracted them. Right? And this is where we often have a deep lack of humility in the process. And this is why Rachel raised the issue of humility in regard to our service. We, we, we need to learn to be humble in our service if we're... One of us is losing our battery. It's probably Mary's. It might be mine. Yeah. Um, 
We need to be humble uh, with our service. Um, just that there. You go. Um, and if we're humble with our service, we will automatically notice these areas where we're out of harmony, where there's a consistent thing happening in our law of attraction and we can see it happening, and we'll start to address it. And that's beautiful. That's, so these spirits, the beauty of it is these same spirits that come along to help us, they, we are, sorry, that where we think we're helping them, they are actually helping us to also go through and work through many things that we still need to work through. And, and if we see it in this nice, humble way, we would uh, start to... I think you're right now, if you speak. We would, we would start to have a lot more self-reflection in the process of what we do. With that humility too, I feel for myself, it's actually owning how I'm feeling in that moment too. Because it's like um, Angelo talks often to myself about the embarrassment of a feeling that you get when you're with the spirit or, or a feeling that I'm wanting to avoid. And not allowing that to take place in the moment. Yeah. So quite often in the moment you need to feel something yeah, and you're often not feeling it. And, and share, if you need to cry, just allow yourself to cry in that moment mm -hmm. because it's bringing up something that I've got in myself. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you were saying? No, that's no, right. That's it. Um, if, um, who hasn't had a question? Cess yes. hasn't had a question yet, so let's ask this. Okay. Um, can I ask about when it's a spirit, say a relative, I feel my great-grandfather is um, with me mm -hmm. and he, was, um, he wouldn't let any of his seven or eight daughters get married mm -hmm. and I've recently become aware of his presence around me mm -hmm. and so I find it hard not to be angry with him. So is that it? I mean, uh, and I understand that there's no righteous anger. Mm -hmm. Well, if you understood there was no righteous anger, then you wouldn't be getting angry with him. Mm. So you don't really understand that. It's an intellectual concept. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. yeah. But go on. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I hadn't really. Um, so I guess when I just feel my emotion, I'll feel compassion for him too. No, now you're trying to manufacture something you don't feel. <laughs> you, you feel anger for, for him. Mm. Uh, why do you feel anger? I feel he's... I feel a pressure coming from him and his... Um, yes? I'm trying to feel my emotion, but he doesn't want me to. I feel he wants me to stay where he wants me so he can control me. Yes. That's what I feel. I agree. And I feel that that's where a lot of my pain comes from, that attitude of the man towards the woman. And can you see if you fully embrace that emotion, the grief that you feel about a male attempting to control you, that you would actually release a lot of grief? Mm. But instead you choose to get angry. So, so can you see your choice to get angry is actually taking you further away from healing the emotion. See, once you, once you feel the grief of his oppression, you will, you will close the hole of his oppression inside of you and he will no longer be able to oppress you. Do you understand? Mm. The grief of the, oh, oh, that you feel, that you're not, the grief that's present in, within you that you're not allowing yourself to feel is causing the attraction in order so that you feel that grief. But instead of feeling the grief... You're just getting angry with him. So, so you're actually preventing yourself from healing and at the same time degrading your own condition by getting angry with him for him being attracted to you because of the grief inside of you. Mm. Can you see? I've just only just become aware of this in the last, I don't know, yeah, no, fortnight. Yep. And so just of that influence. It, so, yeah, I guess... Rachel says, like, Yeah, Rachel something. wants to add something. Um, okay, so... The issue um, is, as Jesus points out, surrounding the idea that the anger is righteous, that this man is wrong and you are right to be angry. If you are able to release this feeling within yourself and merely see your anger as indicative of how much pain is within you, you will be more apt to release the anger 
and get to the pain. It is while you hold on to the sense of injustice and that, they, that he is wrong that you maintain a sense of being justified in your anger. This is the major thing which you must, must shift. Then there may still be anger within you, but you will, it will flow out of you. This holding on to the sense that he is wrong and you are right to be angry is what keeps this as a repetitive cycle for you. Mm. If, if you can release this belief, this belief about righteousness to be angry, which is an emotion, at present you understand intellectually what we refer to, but if you can find the emotion within yourself surrounding the injustice and release this, then your anger will flow... There will, it will not dissolve, it will flow out of you and you will be in connection with the pain and grief you have surrounding this issue. And the anger, when it flows out of you, may flow out of you within a very short period of time. Yes, right? If you fully definitely. connect to it, it will flow out to you in seconds rather than in hours. And, and, and you will very, very rapidly in that place get to the grief that, of the oppression of a man trying to control you, a woman. And, and you will grieve that. And in the process of grieving that, the whole inside of you allowing this to occur covers over. And now it doesn't matter what a man tries to oppress you with, it has no effect on you at all. You won't even feel it, in fact. You, it, it, you won't even notice him there, for exa unless you chose to connect. Oh, is my grandfather here? Oh, yes, I can feel it. Oh, yes, I can see. You've still got the same thing yeah, with women. Uh, but, but it wouldn't bother you anymore and you would not feel uh, oppressed by it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can, can I just uh, refer to this issue that we have with spirits about getting angry with the spirits that we attract to ourselves? This is an indicator of our lack of humility. Does that make sense? The, every time we get angry with the spirits we are attracting to ourselves, we are not understanding that many times these spirits are attracted to us and they have no idea why they are attracted to us. And in fact, you have more of an idea of why they are attracted to you than they do, because you are more educated with the principles of truth than they are. So oftentimes they just feel drawn to you and they don't even understand why. They just go, I don't know, I just feel like, oh, for some reason this, this really nasty woman's always pulling me into her. You know, that's how they feel. You know, why are they, why are they doing that? I don't understand. Why, you know, and so often they are in this place of not even understanding why they're there. And then on top of that, they get sworn at <laughs> for being there. Um, and then they get even more indignant, as you would if you felt you were being misunderstood. And, and yet you are the person who knows more truth. And you know, and you've been told many times, that the reason why they're attracted to you and into your life is because of something in your emotional condition that causes the attraction. They don't even know that. They don't, they're not even aware of that. And so, so what we need to become, if we really love them, what we need to become aware of is that we already know more intellectually, so therefore there is more responsibility on us to work through the issue as to why we're attracting them, rather than going down the track of blaming them and attacking them for being around us or surrounding us. If we may add to that from a celestial perspective, when we view these interactions um, from our condition with a viewpoint upon the earth, it is as if you tussle with each other. These earthbound spirits and those of you in the earth plane, if we may um, give you the image of a dog fight, um, each of you um, snarling and biting and grabbing at each other, um, placing the blame upon the other, this, the earthbound spirit and the person who is, they are attracted to or who is attracting them, each desires many times to blame the other. And this is one of the um, conditions which um, keeps any soul in the condition of the hells, the desire to blame or to um, avoid our own pain and make it the problem of another. So while you continue this, it is very difficult for us to intercede into such a dogfight and it is very circular. It, it keeps both the spirit and the individual and many times it is uh, many spirits and many individuals in very similar situations in certain areas um, keeps them in this very low state. 
if you are able to um, cease your desire to blame, uh, to shift the blame, to avoid your pain and acknowledge the truth, just as Jesus suggests, this, this enables us to make a connection with you. The circular action is ceased and you are standing for yourself, taking response, some more responsibility for yourself. And in this way, there is some truth within you and we are able to connect to you once there is some desire for truth or some acknowledgement of truth within you. Truth is a great... Um, can't find the word. Sorry, Rachel. Uh, not leveler. It it makes it enables us equal opportunities, if you like. When someone, it is an equal opportunity um, <laughs> um, quality. Once a person, no matter what their condition, desires truth, they have the opportunity to connect with God and a celestial being almost immediately. Can you, can you see to Cecily how if, if I'm in this, uh, this dogfight thing is really important to understand. It's sort of physically, if you could liken it physically, it's like Mary being really upset with me about something she feels I'm doing to her, me being really upset with Mary about something she's doing, or that I feel she's doing to me. So I hit her. She hits me, I hit her, she hits me, I hit her, she hits me, I hit her. Where are we going? Nowhere. It's only... Uh, we're going into this escalating area of violence towards each other, are we not? Isn't, isn't that where we're going? But now, if, if I hit her, and instead of her hitting me back, she just had a cry, there is not going to be an escalation, is there, of that violence. Can you see that? Or if she hit me, and all I, instead of hitting her back, I had a cry, then there'd be less of a chance of escalating violence as well. Can you see that? And what Rachel's actually saying is that if I hit you and you have a cry, given, especially this spirit interaction thing, given how similar our conditions are, if he starts crying about the pain he's in, I, it's actually quite likely that I start so crying. crying. <laughs> about having hit me. Does that and make then, sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you see, because of the law of attraction, it is often where I've got very similar emotions that would have caused the attraction together in the first place anyway. And then she's saying even further, if I hit him, he has a cry and then he reaches out in love and to hugs me. And her. It's definitely going to change me. Yeah. Can you see that? So, so many of us, what we're choosing to do with spirits is we're choosing to go, I hit, I hit the spirit. And what can we expect back from a, from a, a fairly dark spirit? Of course, he's probably going to hit me back, right? And so I hit him again. <laughs> so I get hit back again. Right? And I'm not seeing him, but I, I feel these emotions towards him, so they're hitting him, or her in this case. And, and then, so what's she going to feel? She's going to feel like she wants to hit me, isn't she? Isn't she going to feel like... And, and yet I'm the person who's learnt more about the truth. Here, obviously, but not here yet. <laughs> I've learned it here, but I've learned enough here to know that just hitting them is wrong in the first place. Haven't I? But obviously not. But <laughs> obviously not. And this is what Rachel was saying about this, this condition in our hearts of righteous anger, that it's, it's, they are wrong, so I am right. Um, they hit me. That is wrong. I am right. To I have the right angry. to the back. That's a big emotion, <laughs> she's saying, for the group in general. Yeah. Um, and if, if you can work on that, then you won't be as apt to hit back. When, when we were in the States, I gave a talk uh, uh, in the States about the power of love over evil. And in that talk, and, and I don't think it's on YouTube yet, is it? You got, sorry? Not, not yet. Not yet, no. So it will be soon. But um, in that talk, I outlined some, uh, what I called the, the uh, psychology of evil. And one of, the, one of the things I mentioned about the psychology of evil is this idea that there is such a thing as righteous anger. Right? There have been many wars and huge amounts of murders and everything that have occurred on this planet, rapes included and all sorts of things included, because somebody was righteously enraged. And yet we often put it in play every day of our life with our spirit friends. And you notice, most of the time I even call even the dark spirits our spirit friends. Because are they not just people 
who have also been damaged, the same as we have. And while they might not be too friendly <laughs> at the moment, we have the chance to turn every one of them into friends. In fact, historically, I've known of many, many people, you know, obviously in 2,000 years of life we get to observe and meet many people. And there's been many people, in fact, that have been tortured to death, historically, who have become best of friends with their own torturer through a process of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah? They're not in a state of righteous anger with them. Yeah. Very, it's very powerful. Understand. And that's what happened with um, Angelo's friend, wasn't it? That he, he didn't mm. hold on to anger. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Um, what is the time? Can I just ask? Five to five. Five to five, five. okay. Um, you guys are okay? Yeah. I'm almost at wee time again. <laughs> um, so something Me that too. the world needed to know. <laughs> um, can, we, can we come down here and then up the back? Thank you. <laughs> I don't find that I have a lot of anger. I find that I, I've been alone most of my life. I find that I now seem to be asking spirits to come and be with me and help me. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask one of our spirit friends whether they feel you have a lot of anger? Yeah, sure. That'd be good. And if I can answer honestly, um, yep. the mediums are going to have trouble with it. <laughs> well, Rachel's or um, just wanted to point out that you do have a lot of anger, and that it is not um, you don't express it, but it is partly what pushes people away. This this sense of anger. It's one reason why you've been alone a lot of your life. And now. Now, can you see straight away that you have a feeling inside of you that that's not true? So, so go with that. You understand? Go with that feeling that that's not true. So, so what we've had is a, is a celestial spirit say to you, look, you do have a lot of anger. Just see what angels. Yeah, I got the same thing. Yeah. But I got it was related to the loneliness. Yep. It is certainly related to the loneliness. But if you, if you go into the state of... Oh, that's not true. I don't feel anger on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not a very angry person on a day-to-day -day basis. And let yourself feel that. Right? Then can you see straight away there's quite a lot of resistance to being told even the truth about the anger? Can you see that? Yes, it's, I can. Is that because I um, had to suppress my anger as a child? Uh, there's lots of reasons. Um, and that's why, certainly one of them. But... There's also an internal judgment that you have of anger now. Yes. What are your internal judgments of anger? What do you feel about anger? When other people are angry, what do you feel? I want to run away and hide. I don't like to see any anger at all. So you're frightened of anger? Yes. So that's one, one internal judgment that you're going to have towards it. Is there anything else you feel about anger? Do you feel it's very I... sp spiritual? No, it's not. I don't find it very spiritual. Okay. I find it... a. Um... When, um, not a very nice um, thing to have. On the, on the few occasions you've ever let yourself feel anger, what have you felt afterwards? Um, I don't know whether I've ever let myself feel um, complete anger. There's some times that you have in the past. If you, go, you have to go back a fair while, though. I know. I know as a child I had dreadful temper tantrums and... Yeah. Um, and what did you feel uh, after, after the age of three, I didn't have them anymore. What happened before, uh, before then? Like, what did mum and dad do when you had them? Um, my mother ignored me and my father picked me up and cited poetry to me. Right, OK. OK, so both of them suppressed you in some way with yes. the expression of it. Yep. And, and when's the last time you ever remember being angry in a, in a way that you feel is angry? Possibly um, when my ex-husband told me that um, if, the, if my nephews were coming out for the holidays, which they had since my brother died, um, that he was going to go 
away and um, I told him that um, to keep on going. Yep. And I was angry then, I know. Yep. Yep. Okay, so that's the last time you remember. Um, well, that was the one that came Come to, to me. And it's yep. no, that's fine. So, so I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate to you in this discussion is that, firstly, our celestial spirit friends see something totally different inside of you than you see yourself. <laughs> so that's number one thing to remember. The, the beauty of some spirit communication, and this is where, you know, again, getting back to our theme about love being involved in mediumship, is that we have the ability to be very humble and accept what they're saying to us if we know we're connecting to a celestial spirit. So you might be able to say, oh, I don't think Mary is, and that's fine. You can have to make that assumption. And, then, and you could say, oh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think Peter is either. And the reality is that I would have said the same thing to you. So uh, I don't think AJ is either. <laughs> and, and therefore hold on to your own opinion. You could choose to do that. But, but the alternative is also possible. And that is, you could, you could say, wow, if they're saying I've got a fair bit of anger inside of me, then perhaps I have. And I could start praying about that, about, all right, help me see the anger. Like, help me have some dreams that help me to connect to some anger. Help me, you know, just in terms of just from a day to day, help me see what my blockages are to this feeling of anger that I have. Does that make sense? Yes. And you could allow yourself to actually conceive the possibility of an alternative explanation. Now, the reason why I asked that question of our spirit friends and not the question you asked is because when you made that statement right up front, all, a lot of times what I feel from you is a very large amount of anger. Right? And so that tells me that there is definitely anger within you. The key is that you've just become so detuned from it. You've, you've distanced yourself emotionally from the anger and this is actually causing you to distance yourself from your own soul, to push your own soul away. When you start to actually feel the anger that's present, you will actually be closer to your own soul and therefore more in tune with its other emotions. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, for, for many of us, what we do is we detune ourselves from one particular or a group of emotions that we don't like at all. Shame is one of those emotions. Anger is another type of uh, those emotions that we have a lot of judgment of. Fear, for men, fear is an emotion they detune from quite strongly, for men. We push that emotion away, not realising that while we're pushing that emotion away, we are distancing ourselves from our own soul. We are causing a, 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 a situation inside of ourselves where we now cannot feel any emotions very strongly. Right? And, or we're very selective about it, and therefore we don't have the ability to heal them. Yeah. Thank you. You can continue with the question, though, if you wish. Do you remember it now, or do you think that's enough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember now. No worries. So, what, was, what was your name? Sorry, Catherine. Catherine, yeah. So, so Catherine, my feelings for, for are if you allow yourself to conceive of the possibility that you are angry inside, rather than telling yourself that you're not a very angry person, then allow God, ask questions of God and your guides about helping you come to see what you're angry about. It will actually help you see why aloneness has been created in your life. Does that make sense? Because your original question was actually about aloneness and, and the fact that you are quite often feeling alone. Yeah. Well, I take myself away from everyone else. You do? Yes. yes. And um, I feel that it's a lot about feeling... One of the reasons that you're blocked to knowing that... Like, feeling that you're angry is that you feel that no one will love you if you're angry. And I feel that's partly why you take yourself away from people as well. There's, there's a lot of sadness about feeling just unlovable, like the real Catherine. So, the, yeah. And part, partly it's part of the anger too, Catherine. It's like, yeah. it's this feeling like it's pointless being around anybody because nobody loves me. And, and there is some anger in that. Can you see that? Like, why should I spend time with anybody? Nobody loves me anyway. Yeah. Yes, and, I suppose that's right. So that is, an anger, that is an anger anyway that's present. 
So you will find with every problem that we have, there is always a linkage between the problem and what we are denying in ourselves. And, and this is where it's very, very important that uh, if we use mediumship, that we're open to hearing from our spirit friends the truth about the condition rather than what we think is the truth about the condition. <coughs> The, the beauty of our spirit friends, like both Angelo and, and Rachel and Tim in this discussion, but there is obviously many thousands of celestial spirit friends with us at the moment, your own guides with us at the moment. The beauty of their condition is they see very accurately every single emotion we are denying. Every single one. Now, if I am humble enough to hear from them, I now have a unique opportunity to hear from a person who can actually see the emotion that's stored in me. Right? So I relish every discussion I have with my spirit friends about my emotional condition, even when they tell me I have things that I can't recognise. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. All right, well, I think uh, what we'd like to do now is maybe have a break. I know some of you might have brought something to eat or something like that. You might like to do that. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, Fab is going to uh, sing a few songs for us um, and, uh, and then I am going to fire up the karaoke system and I'll sing a few songs for you to get you started and then you can come up and do a bit of karaoke if you wish because um, we've got the karaoke system going. Can I just have um, one more point on our discussion, discussion? as well from Sorry. Rachel? But yeah. Is this about the discussion or about the next bit? Um, no, I just wanted to say something you can hear. Okay, I'll go, then you go. Um, um, when we were in Greece, um, I had the lovely experience of right before our first talk, a group of guides who were actually guiding the people who came to the talk came to me to give um, some... Pra they wanted to specifically give practical tips... Um, for people to stay in connection with their spirit guides and guardians, uh, which was really lovely. And uh, just uh, Rachel was just prompting me to... Um, I'll type them up and I'll put them on the blog in the next couple of days because they're very relevant for everyone, I feel. I think there was about... Uh, six, or six, six or seven. And they're very practical, practical grounded things. Uh, one mm. of them is drinking a lot of water and, and other things. And they give some explanation in there. Mm. But Rachel was just... Um, Obviously, I had some difficulties with today's exercise and uh, Rachel was just talking to me there at the end because um, one of the points, the last point that they say to everyone is to, to regard your guide as your friend, as someone who's had a life on earth and someone who has been allocated to you because their personality or their life on earth is very similar to your own. Um, and so... Rachel told me that today was going to be um, very powerful for me and I, I had no idea about why. But um, that's because uh, she's been encouraging me and having me encourage other people for quite some time to get to know the, per the life of your um, guide when they were on earth and in the spirit world. And um, I think that's because that increases their rapport with us. So um, that I just... She wanted me to share that bit at the end, that if you're able to open up to who is this character who's there to guide me, very often we use our mediumship in a, what, a selfish manner of what can I get from this person? Mm. Um, what, come on, give me the answer, you know, when actually we do ourselves a disservice because if we're open to their life and we have more of this friendship connection with them, not only um, can they give us those answers much more easily, but we, there's more of a love exchange. It's more of a personal relationship. Yeah, yeah and I'd just like to point out something with regard to Angelo. Many of you have now been hearing for months from Angelo, and yet many of you have never even asked him about anything about his own life. Have you, have you noticed that? That many have never even asked him about his own life. And this is an indication of how selfish we sometimes are in our interactions with spirits. We, we just want them there to give us something for ourselves or, or for some other purpose that's addictive. But very rarely do we want to actually have an increasing friendship or a bond of friendship. And friendship involves knowing the person. That's what Angelo's been telling everyone to ask their guides yeah. just what, yeah. what they do. Yeah. yeah. What, 
And, and I just feel that, uh, like, like, one of the first things that I do whenever I connect with the spirits is I ask them about their life. Mm. Because, because you find out a lot about the individual if you've never met them before. You find out a lot about the person, about their life, about why they have the attitudes they have, the feelings they have, what's going on in their life and so forth. And, and that is an act of love that you give a person, is to, know, is to ask them about themselves. Does that make sense, everyone? Mm. Teresa, thanks. If we could just go over there and then come back. And obviously, just while you're getting to Teresa, that what it showed for me today is how much undealt with emotion I have about my own life on earth, that just hearing from my guide about her life on earth triggers in me. And it's the same for so many of us, yeah. Um, what I've just realised, and this is not just my guides, but with other people, is that I'm very frightened of my guide. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid to get to know them. Mm. Um, yeah. Why is that? Well, I think it's because I don't want to know me. And, um, I don't think so. I, if I connect, I'm going to get hurt, I think. Um, that's one of your beliefs, certainly. But, but can we go a bit deeper, Teresa? Why would you get hurt from a person who's guiding you? Because I can have to trust them. Yeah, so this is an issue of trust. You, can you see you don't want to trust people? And in fact, you often attract into your life totally untrustworthy people. Yeah. And the, many of the people that you interact with on a daily basis are untrustworthy people. If you look at many of your internet interactions, which anybody in the world can observe, many times you're interacting with very untrustworthy people. And that's to trigger this emotion of how much you can't trust anybody. But, but your guide is one person you could trust. And, but you don't want to feel the emotions associated with the risk of trust. Do you, do you see the difference? Uh, you, you, you don't want to take the risk of trusting somebody. The it's a vulnerable it's the vulnerable It's a vulnerable place of trusting somebody and then having them disappoint you. Yeah. You don't want to feel that emotion again. You've had enough of that emotion in your life. But the reality is you need to feel that emotion and release it. And the only way you're going to do that is by learning to trust somebody. And who, who better to trust than, <laughs> who's, who's better to trust than your own guide who loves you and cares about you and knows your life? Yeah. So take the risk. Yeah. Can you see even just taking the risk is going to bring up a fair bit of grief for you? I don't believe I can. You don't believe you can? Mm. Um, yeah, now this is, this is where anger takes over. Yeah. See, we don't realise that many of our statements are born in anger. So when you say, I don't believe I can trust, really what your soul is screaming out at the time is, how dare you ask me to trust somebody? Don't you realise what's happened to me in the past when I trusted somebody? Every time I've trusted somebody, somebody's hurt me. That's the, that's the place that you're actually in, that rage. The key is to feel that and then you'll start feeling some of the grief under it, which is this terrible feeling of being hurt by people you have trusted in the past. Mm. So, so this idea that you can't do it is born out of a desire to not want to do it. And all of us need to understand this, that often our statements tell us a great deal about where our rage is. And if we listen to ourselves we'd often be able to express ourselves more directly with regard to the rage we feel and therefore quickly connect with the emotion. Last night we had a uh, discussion with a group of people and, uh, and I was talking about mothers and how badly their mothers had treated them. And, and it was a, quite a confronting discussion because, because for everybody present, most of them had had mothers that had treated them quite badly. And, uh, and in fact... I, the, there was quite a lot of feeling in the room that I was wrong in saying these things about their mothers. And yet, I was just expressing the rage that each of the women that I was speaking with have towards their mothers because of how their mothers had treated them. And we often are totally in refusal to even connect with the rage that we feel about how we've been treated. Yeah. So go with that, I don't want to trust anybody feeling that you have um, and allow yourself to feel that more fully. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there was a lady at the back that we... Uh, uh, just here was the... 
about a different subject altogether. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, like thinking about children. If you hold you the microphone. Hold the mic to your mouth. Uh, thinking about children and growing up, you know, children, at what point do they, you know, start to or can start to recognise the difference between blaming their parents and then taking responsibility? Can I, can I say that question is born of a parent who is not taking responsibility? The reality is, if we realised as parents how much we have damaged our own children, we would never expect our child to never blame us for the damage. We would, we would be totally accepting of any blame that our child put towards us with regard to how we've damaged them. So, so what we're often doing as parents is we're saying, oh, I want to get my child to get to 21 and then my child stops blaming me. I, I, can't, I know people who are a thousand years old who are still blaming their parents. Now, what I'm saying, I don't agree that it's righteously so, but... The fact is, their parent did cause that damage. And if, if a parent's on the receiving end of that blame, the parent would be completely humble to what they've created. Yes. And the fact that we're not completely humble to what we've created as parents is a good indication of why we're still getting blamed. You see, a, a parent who's gone through repentance very rarely afterwards gets blamed continuously by their children. Right. Yep. So at some point, forgiveness comes in. At some point, repentance, repentance of the parent comes in. Right. And then when a re parent has felt repentance, there's a higher likelihood that they will receive forgiveness from their child. Mm. Yeah. If you expect forgiveness without repentance, then you are making your child's pro process much, much, much more difficult. And it requires a much higher development in love for somebody to forgive you when you are not repentant. Right. Does that make mm. sense? So if we are a parent on the divine love path, we need to sincerely look at this issue of <coughs> repentance, not the issue of whether our children forgive us, but the issue of whether we are sorry for what we've done. We often say we are, but we don't mean it. And whenever our child projects the blame, we get angry, which is an indication that we are not sorry for what we have done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And there was someone down... Just here, this lady with the sunglasses, yeah. Um, I, I have a question, but I just wanted to point out first that behind you the wall press is made by Humble and Sons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny That's name. Lovely. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so all our interactions with the spirits who are not celestial spirits but lower ones are basically the sa are they basically the same? Uh, you know, our, our blame and our, our our errors in our interactions with those spirits are basically the same as what the same thing is exactly the same as we do with each other uh, in body on the earth. In what way are um, you referring to? Well, if someone's angry with us, we react in anger, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a difference between that interaction with a person in body and, and the same? Because it's the same emotion, right? It's the same condition in our soul. Same, same, same condition, condition in our soul, the same, same emotion. emotion. Yeah, I just and to and the person in the spirit world feels it as badly yes. as, as yeah. a person on earth would feel it as well. Yes. Quite often more, 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 more so, so yeah. because they are a bit more sensitive to the expression of emotion. So quite often they even feel it worse than a person on earth would feel it. Yeah. I'm sorry I got Thanks. so hung up on the humble and son. <laughs> <laughs> Because Mr. Humble's son must be very humble. Yeah. <laughs> Just. Because yeah, yeah. he's the son of humble. He's the son of humble. Uh, anyway. But, but yeah, you're you're right about the. Uh, don't don't. We've got to stop seeing spirits as uh, entities other than just people. You know, we, we've got to stop this process of sort of thinking that for some reason a spirit feeling it must be different than how we feel it. And also placing, <coughs> oh, a spirit said it, therefore it's gospel, or, you know, oh, that person's spirit influence. There's so exactly. much, uh, yeah. yeah. We've got to start just treating them as people. And just like any other people we meet, sometimes they have pure emotion, sometimes they don't. Sometimes, and it depends on their development as to how much pure emotion they have. And sometimes they have dark uh, feelings towards us and sometimes they'd like to kill us and sometimes they don't. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they have very much brighter um, opinions of us. 
And, and the reality is, sometimes we have quite the same things with them. And, and we need to understand that they are just people like we are, and therefore just as sensitive, and sometimes far more sensitive, to our own emotions than, uh, than what, the, as we are to other people's emotions. So if we have that kind of rapport with them, we won't be going, and this is what I love about our celestial friends when they come and speak, they're always going, you know, our lovely brothers and sisters that are in the hells, mm. and notice that even just the whole idea of calling a spirit who's in the hells your brother, mm. is in itself an equalisation and a statement of humility, because they are our brothers or sisters. And our lovely brothers and sisters in the hells we need to have just as much compassion for as we have for ourselves and as we need to have for each other. You know, unfortunately for many of us still, we are still having a lot of personalities inside of, you know, even in an auditorium this large of people who meet with each other regularly, we get annoyed with each other and frustrated with each other and very few of us are self-reflective yet because the reality is if we were self-reflective, we wouldn't be annoyed. And we wouldn't be frustrated. We'd go, oh, there's another lovely brother and sister just opening that little hole in me <laughs> so that I can see, wow, I have that anger still or I have this situation still or I have that situation still. And instead of going, you did this to me and you did that to me and you did that, instead of doing that, we'd be going, what's inside of me? You know, we'd be far more self-reflective. One of the things I like about Mary's book group is that the, the books that, that Afra penned through Robert James Lees um, are all about self-reflection. Mm. And that's what's lovely about them. And it's something that we all need if we're going to improve uh, in our mediumship skills. We need to have a lot more self-reflection. If mm. we have self-reflection, we're capable of love. If we have no self-reflection, we're just going to point the finger at everybody else all the time and, and not examine ourselves anymore. Yeah? Mm. <coughs> Sometimes I feel we get angrier at the spirits because we feel we can't get away from them. Like if someone, if say Cecily gets angry at me, I can go away. Yep. But sometimes, you know, the spirit can be there all the time and, and, and yeah, that's where we feel Yeah, but the when... spirit's going, yeah, you make me be here all the time. What's <laughs> wrong with you? Why but, can't you let me go? But that's where I feel we get caught up in it, isn't it? That totally. We, we feel and, we can't get away. But, but that's right and yeah. that's good. Because, because, you know, with Cecily, you can say, oh, it's Cecily, so I'm going to leave her. Uh, or you can even say, oh, I need space from Cecily to deal with the emotion. But the reality is you're not going to deal with the emotion until you submit humbly to the grief that's caused the attraction. And, and this is where I feel many people are still not, they're not able to be soft. Do you, do you understand what I mean by that? It's like when, when you get attacked by another person, what is your general response? Is it softness? No. It's not softness even to the attack. It's like, wow, I'm just getting attacked. Wow. <laughs> like, it's not even that. It's, a, it's like, how dare you attack me? This is wrong. You, well, what are you doing to me? And the beauty with our spirit interactions, and this is what I love about spirit interactions, is you cannot avoid them by stepping away from them physically. And this is a wonderful thing. Because if we could, we would be far less conscious of what we're creating. Mm. Yeah. I agree, though. That's the, the... <laughs> How about if we uh, don't know our guides? I feel I'm guided, mm -hmm. but I, I, don't, I can't see them and I can't hear them. Uh, even though I pray, I include, include them in, into my prayers every day. Yeah. But I don't feel I have a, a really good connection, a, a connection with them. Yeah. Well, um, the talk that Mary mentioned about what we did in Greece, which was actually more like a discussion. It was just like around, uh, we, had, we had a discussion with 20 or so people where we outlined, where the spirits actually outlined how we could have a better connection with our guides. My suggestion is that when that talk is uh, put on YouTube, is to have a listen to that or watch that talk, because that will help you. There, there is a long list of things that we can do uh, that can significantly improve our connection with our guides. So my suggestion, firstly, is to have a have a listen to that talk, and uh, and during that talk you will see there is many aspects physically, emotionally, 
and spiritually that we can do to actually have a stronger connection with our guides and actually be able to communicate with them freely. All of your guides do wish to communicate with you. So, so the only reason why a communication is not happening is something to do with ourselves. So we need to have self-reflection even in that particular thing. So many of us feel like, oh, I desperately want my guide to talk with me, mm. but, but there must be something blocking it if it's not happening. And it has to be within ourselves, because our guide does want the communication. So uh, what I would be doing is having a look at, at that presentation when it comes out, and when Mary, Mary says she's going to type up some <laughs> of that information as well, uh, when she gets around to doing that, put, have a look at some of that information, and ask yourself how you can actually help your guide connect with you more strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was just giggling, because both of us go, we do this action, I'll type it. She'll type it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I haven't, I haven't sat in front of you. The reason why the website hasn't been updated for four months is because <laughs> I'm not that keen on typing lately. <laughs> but anyway, that's an issue we'll have to address. Um, so we'd like to thank you for your time again today. And uh, please stick around, though, if you'd like to stick around and have a bit of a sing. What we'll do firstly, though, is uh, Fab's got a few songs prepared that we'd love to hear, hear him sing. And feel free to move about a bit if that's what you want to do, if Fab's OK with that. Um, so it's not like you have to stay captive to, uh, to Fab's presentation. And then uh, we'll, while Fab's doing that, we'll be finalising the setup of some of the karaoke. And uh, we'll start the karaoke off for anybody who would like to share in that process. Yeah. And Thanks, I don't know everyone. how long that will go, so we'll just see how long that goes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. And th thanks to Peter and Mary, too. Thanks, Thank you. See, you put new batteries in it.